Welcome to Wyoming Perspectives. Wyoming Youth Sports, Concussions and Head Injuries, A Parent's Guide. I'm Craig Blumenschein with Wyoming PBS. We have an excellent panel in our studio tonight and we're ready to answer your questions. But first, a little background on head injuries and youth sports in Wyoming. High school sports in Wyoming, they provide us with a sense of community. There we go. For thousands of Wyoming youth and high school athletes, activities play an important role in the adoption and maintenance of a physically active lifestyle. According to the National High School Sports Related Injury Surveillance Study, participation in high school sports, one of the most popular physical activities among adolescents, has grown rapidly from an estimated 4 million participants in the early 70s to nearly 7.7 million participants today. While the health benefits of a physically active lifestyle, including participating in sports, are undeniable, athletes are always at risk for injury. The challenge to injury epidemiologists and what Wyoming PBS wants to explore tonight is whether injury rates can be reduced among high school athletes to the lowest possible level without discouraging adolescents from engaging in this important form of physical activity. Too often, injury prevention in this population is overlooked, according to the report, as sports-related injuries are thought to be unavoidable. In reality, sports-related injuries are largely preventable through interventions based on evidence-based science. The morbidity, mortality, and disability caused by high school sports-related injuries can be reduced through the development of effective prevention strategies and through programmatic decisions based on injury prevention. According to the American Journal of Sports Medicine, 15% of injuries among high school athletes are concussions. Of those concussions, 75% were experienced by male athletes. 47% of youth sports concussions were sustained by football players. And it's not just football that causes youth sports concussions. But what's interesting is the rate of sports-related concussions per 100,000 athletic exposures includes sports like football, ice hockey, girls soccer, boys wrestling, and boys basketball. Again, welcome to Wyoming Perspectives. I am Craig Blumenschein, and we're here in the studios of Wyoming PBS for our live show of Wyoming Perspectives, and we welcome you. We do want to point out that we have some resources avail available for you that, we, that um, we've used in research and preparation for tonight's show, and they'll be available along with a, a stream of this show at wyomingpbs.org slash concussions. Also, throughout the night, we would love to hear from you. We, we want your questions, and we urge you to give us a call. Um, at, our operators are standing by at 1-800-495-9788. You can also email us your questions at concussions at wyomingpbs.org or you can tweet your questions to us using hashtag WYOConcussions, that's W-Y-O Concussions. But as I said before, we have a wonderful panel in our studio tonight and I would like to introduce them to you now. Ryan Pinson is the Director of Sports Medicine at the University of Wyoming. He's new to Wyoming, came to, to Laramie um, late this summer from the University of Northern Arizona. And Ryan, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You bet. Trevor Wilson is the uh, Assistant Com Associate Commissioner for the Wyoming High School Activities Association, a position that he's held for almost nine years. Yes. Um, Trevor will um, visit with us about really the, the um, front running or the front leading work that the state has done at the High School Activities Association relative to this issue. So Trevor, welcome. Thanks, Greg. And also with us is Todd Wright. Todd is a former University of Maryland football player, um, was Boomer Esiason's center in college. He also comes at this from a little different angle. He's been the director of Rocky Mountain Reentry Services in Riverton for 23 years, and he works day in and day out with people that have sustained traumatic brain injuries, some of which have sustained those in injuries in high school sports. Also, Todd's a middle school football coach here in Riverton, and he has some very unique proposals and ideas and thoughts about how to teach the game of football safely. So as we um, begin our uh, discussion tonight, again, everyone, welcome. We're glad that you're here with Thanks us. Thanks for having us. I think the, the, the question that we need to get out of the way first, and we'll start with you, Ryan, is what is a concussion? You know, concussion is defined as a disturbance in brain function caused by uh, direct or indirect uh, trauma to the head or, or body that can cause the brain to have a disturbance in, in function. 
So some of those disturbances in function can be headaches, imbalances, memory loss, um, so on and so forth, those kinds of things. Changes in personality as well, that can be also a sign of a concussion. And so Todd, when you, as being a football coach, you're watching kids play, you're watching kids practice. What do you look for, and how can, how can you tell if, if, a, if a little athlete has had an injury like that? Yeah, I, I can just, th I think back to when I was in college, I hate to do this, but there was a guy named Kip Jawish, and, and we were in a spring game. It was so overt. Some, our, we had a dandy running back, and he just came up and bat a wang And Kip just kind of stumbled and just went like this, and boom, he was down. A very, very overt example of that. And we were all laughing, ha, 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 you know, that's 30 years ago. And, and when you, today, what I watch for is if a kid comes off the field, I watch, I watch the action, what's going on. And if, a, if there's a helmet to helmet blower, if a kid hits the ground hard, um, um, and he comes over and he's, he's kind of going like this, or he's diz, dizzy a little bit, they'll always deny it to our young guys, well, because they want to get back out there and play. How's your head feeling? Oh, I got a headache. Okay, give me the helmet. I mean, I mean, I did that three times today, and I'm just like, and maybe because I was going to be on the show or something, I was thinking I was, I was more, uh, more alert to it. But I, I try to, I try to be cognizant of it. It's very, very hard in a game situation to pay attention to that as a coach because you want, you know, you're focused on so many things. Right. Trevor, this is really an issue that um, wasn't on the state's radar maybe eight or nine years ago. But um, in retrospect, Wyoming has been a front runner in trying to um, um, be safe, or, or at least um, um, understand the issue. And you've worked with the state of Wyoming's legislature, and in fact, worked to pass a bill in 2011 relative to this issue. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, it, was, it was great of Senator Landon to contact our office and ask us for our opinion when they were writing this rule or this law. I think it was in 2010 is when they started, but it was adopted in 2011. Um, to, so just to get our opinion of, of how things would work and eventually it did pass and then the best thing that came from that was the fact that now uh, middle school and high school coaches must be trained in the area of concussions. Now that training is a little vague, it's left up to the schools as how they handle that but at least there's some sort of knowledge from each coach that we have in every middle school and high school across our state. And generally what's your experience and how um, um, towns and, and schools in Wyoming are dealing with the issue, who do they get the training from? You know, we have recommended the, the NFHS is the governing uh, organization over uh, um, all state associations, and we recommend that they have a course out there. It's a uh, concussion in sports course. It's a 20-minute course. It's free, um, and we recommended that. And for the most part, I think a majority of our schools took advantage of that. Some may use the heads-up uh, training that we were talking about a little bit ago, but uh, that course I think most of our schools are using. And I want to point out again that, that we have links to that information on our Correct. website. We would urge people to take a look at that and the information from the CDC that we're going to talk about tonight at wyomingpbs.org slash concussions. Um, Ryan, you talked just a little bit about symptoms. Do symptoms differ between kids who are younger, say, the, at a middle school age versus a high school age? And then to follow up on a point that Todd brought up, how do we educate our kids to understand that it's important that they're honest with their coaches and with their parents when they've sustained an in, a head injury? How do we do that? I think kind of starting with the second question first, this time right now in our history is, is paramount. They've had the concussion awareness more so than any other group of students in history. So it's being made aware. They're aware as athletes. They're aware uh, they have parents that are aware. So it's important that we're using this as a catalyst to educate the athletes and educate coaches, parents, on head injuries, concussions. No one concussion is the same. No one child is the same. No one athlete is the same. And they can have a head injury or a concussion, and those two can be different. Now, it's important to distinguish that they should be taken seriously and, and looked at and evaluated in a serious manner, but there is no real set defined uh, substance that will take place when a child or an adolescent or an adult has a concussion. They can all be different, and that's where it's hard to get a gra grasp on, but the education and the foundations of knowing the head injuries, um, it is pertinent, it is valuable information to get from uh, the different organizations and to be educated on it, that will transpire uh, students learning and, and being more upfront about it. 
um, with the head injuries. Do we know um, whether the younger you are, the more at risk you are for a concussion? Yes. Um, and why is that? The brain is developing. The brain is still developing, and, we, and our brains are developing all the time. And uh, I think it's imperative and important to understand that the younger uh, the child is, that brain is still um, very much in a in the learning state. And so, um, from my standpoint, there is a difference. And that younger athlete, um, you need to take precautions with them. Again, we encourage viewers to give us a call tonight at one eight hundred four nine five. 9788. We would love to have your questions. Um, you can also email those to us. The email address is right there on your screen at concussions at wyomingpbs.org. And you can also tweet those questions to us as well at wyoconcussions. Use that hashtag, WYO concussions. Todd, at the start of every year, I'm sure you have a meeting with your athletes and with your parents. Mm -hmm. um, and I know from your work history that this is something that's awfully important to you. Yeah. What do you tell your kids? Well, I, you know, the number one thing, you can tell them whatever you want. You've got to do, in practice, you have to, you have to show the correct technique and then they have to perform it over and over and over. I mean, uh, the squawking is, well, yeah, I'm talking like a coach now or whatever, but the talking, okay, get your eyes up, eyes up, eyes to the sky, this and this and this, but to demonstrate it over and over and over what's safe. And then, and then uh, when, when you see an error, correct it immediately and then you know and try we have a remedial tackling station we have a remedial blocking station not 100 percent perfect at it yet but we do it over and over and over the same way where's your eyes where's your head where's your where's your, how are you how are you lifting what are you doing and over and over rolling that rolling the neck back so that our, our, we're not making contact and then you get into a game and sometimes it still goes out the window and 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 that and that's reality. That's the reality of it. But the, it's over, over learning. Way way over learning. Day and in and day out. What do you tell parents at the start of the year? What if you have a parent that comes up to you and and says, you know what, I like football. Right. My husband played football when he was younger. Right. I'm not sure whether my kid should play football. I'm a little worried about about well, this issue. Well, what I try to do is I have a a, a thing through our rec department and uh, and and, and uh, where we just have a where no pads or anything like that. But I have a like a mini clinic to see you know to to demonstrate the different the different things that we're going to do, and then that they can try it out and then to see if it's a fit, and then uh, you know come to practice. Watch what we do. I don't want our kids going on the ground. Now that happens, but I don't want them on the ground. I don't want their head banging. We play on a, we practice on a, on a grass field. It can be very hard. I don't want a contra coup. I don't want them banging their head on the. I want everything up, and I want everything at half speed or three quarter speed. And when we do go full contact, it answers one of your questions later. I have a bunch of pads down, and then I have a kid holding a pad. Then the other kid's hitting the pad and hitting through them, so they're both falling on the pad. And Trevor, this just isn't a football issue. Yeah. Um, it, inc it includes all sports, so it, your training must be available to all coaches, I would assume. Right, it is available and it is actually required. Um, the golf coach has to take the concussion training just like the football coach. So it is, and in fact, we had a, a little issue at one of our golf tournaments. A kid uh, fell in the ice um, and hit his head, and this is a golfer, and the coach actually held him out of the first day of the state tournament until he could get checked by a specialist and then let him play in the second day of the state tournament. So it's not just a football issue. Um, and like I said, all our coaches are trained and this, guy, this coach was a golf coach. So, Ryan, how do you explain to coaches um, when, that might um, be concerned about winning and that might um, be at a, a tough time in their game that, um, you know what, um, head injuries perhaps trump winning a football game? Does that message get across or, or can it or how do you do it? You know, I think it's just uh, having a working relationship, a good working relationship with your staff and then having an understanding of the importance of the, of the athlete's health um, and, and the risk of putting a student athlete back in is not worth the um, circumstances of the game. You know, uh, I like to win. We all like to win. It, it's part of our competitive nature but at the same time my responsibility is taking care of the student athletes and taking care of their health immediately and long term so I, we have a good working relationship with that and a good understanding um, they're educated as well on it um, this isn't something that's coming in, um, in in the professional realms of, of intercollegiate athletics right right now. It's, it's been ongoing, and it's an ongoing process, and there's always education on it. 
I remember the Heinz Ward story where he was hit and he had a head injury and what did he do? Reached for his ankle, didn't want to come out of the game. Mm -hmm. And our kids see that. Yeah. Um, our our kids, kids understand what happened to Alex Smith last year. He self-reported a concussion and he lost his job. He didn't play, he didn't play again. How do we get beyond that? I think you look at where Alex Smith is today. You know, that would be my answer for that. Yep. You know, um, at the same time, yeah, is it a difficult thing? Sure. But I think Alex Smith was doing the right thing for himself, and he's having a great year this year. Sure. So I think the perspective can't be um, such a narrow focus of a pillar um, right now entity. We can do much more in the immediate to take care of a head injury in the athletic level if we're treating it and letting them heal <coughs> prior to them going in when, where you run the risk of further injury or damaging injury. And we'll talk about that a little, a little more here a little later. Um, Trevor, I wanted to talk to you about something that's been concerning to me and, and Todd lives it at the middle school. But it seems that in Wyoming there might be a disconnect a little bit with the organization of high school sports and the oversight, if you will, of high school sports and the organization and oversight of middle school sports. Um, um, talk about that a little bit. Well, we were, Todd and I were visiting earlier a little bit about it and, you know, we govern, when I say we, the Activities Association govern grades 9 through 12. Um, so when it comes to, you know, Todd's coaching 7th or 8th grade football, <clears throat> and we might get calls about 7th or 8th grade football, but we really don't have any jurisdiction over Todd as a coach or the rules that they play by or anything like that. So uh, he made a good point. If we could all be on the same page with the rules, maybe it might be a contact rule. Some of them, in our high schools, we make, them, make football players have 10 days of practice. Um, a lot of middle schools follow our rules, but there's no, nothing says they have to. Um, you know, or, and three of those days are no pads. So, um, and I think a lot of the middle schools try to follow it, but there is a disconnect because there are no rules when it comes to 6th, 7th, or 8th grade. And I think you can probably carry that even farther when you talk about youth sports sure. at the pre-middle school level. Yeah. Nothing. There's, there's no organization at all. Um, how concerning should that be to parents? And let, let me ask it this way. If your um, child is going to participate in a, in a youth sport, and we'll go around the table with this. Todd, we'll start with you first. Mm -hmm. As a parent, what should you ask a coach? What should you ask a league ad administrator? Not, you know, what would I ask him? I mean, what, what's your standards or how do you teach tackling? Show me how you teach tackling. Show me how you, how you block. Show me how you, you know, you teach pass catching, throwing all the fundamentals, and then, you know, uh, then I'll take it from there. What, what are your practices like? You know, uh, do you have, uh, what kind of, what kind of t hitting drills, what kind of contact drills do you have, and how, how are they managed for, for safety? That kind of stuff, I think. Trevor? Well, Todd's very detailed because one, he's a coach, so he would ask those questions. I'm not sure that most of our parents would know to ask what type of yeah. tackling technique they're. But I, we encourage, and I, I talked about the concussion course. Parents are welcome to take that too. It's it's 20 minutes and it's free. All they have to do is log in. Um, kids can take that. I mean, there's so many resources on there on how to recognize a concussion and what to do if you think your son has a concussion. There's just so much education, and I, I'm not selling that course, but it's just a, sure. it's a great resource for parents, kids, and coaches as well. Ryan, what do you tell that parent of a, of a, of a pre-middle schooler who um, just isn't sure um, what this business of uh, headers in soccer or uh, uh, collisions in football is all about and, and um, want, wants, to, wants to understand whether it's safe for his kids? What, what should they ask? You know, I think they, they can ask the poignant questions of, is it safe for my child to do this? And the answer right now is, there are risks with, with everything that we do. But at the same time, if you're in a league or a conference that educates and gives the awareness, I think that is a proactive approach. Uh, I, w I would like to see the students have that educational background for themselves as well as the parents and there are some resources out there that they should be utilizing the, you know and, and there's a variety of them out there but I think you know the honest answer is is there risk yes there, there's risk with everything whether it's riding a bicycle or a scooter down the street um, you know or playing in sports that I, risk is there I assume that you have seen concussions in all sports absolutely uh -huh. um, I want to talk about a little bit of a gender difference. Um, uh, it's my understanding that women might um, recover less quickly than men, especially young women or girls or boys. Um, is that true? 
We're finding now, and the research, this isn't my research, I'd have to defer to the current evidence-based practice that we're seeing from NCA surveillance. Um, there's a variety of things that are coming out. We are seeing longer time to recover in female athletes than male student athletes. Um, we don't know if that's a self-report or if that's a genetic, uh, genetic uh, gender difference. It, it's still undecided. Uh, male student athletes might have a tendency to hide things a little bit longer. Are there hormonal differences that affect the brain that may relate to uh, longer recovery for female student athletes? Is there a difference in neck strengthening that may have a, a increase in incident rate for females, which we're actually seeing now um, with, with the higher incident rate is trending towards females? Trevor, at the national level, um, are there other issues, um, are there other um, ideas that other states have implemented that are of interest to Wyoming um, from meetings and, and, and things that, that you've been to or that are at least make you curious about ways to make our sports safer? Right. The, the one that the, the common thing or the theme that's out there now is to, to limit contact. And contact is defined in many different ways, but the, the theory is the contact to the ground that, that Todd was talking about. And there, there's been two states that have written uh, rules regarding the contact. I'm talking about practice, not mm -hmm. game stuff. So um, Texas was the first one, and, and I think their rule is, well, not I think, I know their rule is 90 minutes per week of contact. Um, but to me, I, I mean, I don't go to every school, but I know that the schools that I see, they're not tackling to the ground 90 minutes a week. So I know we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. we're, we're doing a lot more of the thud, the, the hit and release. The, the to the ground stuff is, is very limited, um, a lot, maybe a little more in two a days at the beginning, but I think our coaches are doing a great job of, of not hitting, uh, you know, maybe 30 minutes a week max. I, I, just, I just think the 90 minutes is, is, is way too much. Are there parameters in place to understand if a coach isn't meeting those norms? Is, is, is maybe perhaps hitting more than they should? Is that, can that be managed in our state? I think it has to be managed like most of our rules um, by the school and you know there's there's two of us in our office and we can't be everywhere so we rely on uh, schools self-reporting uh, sometimes schools tell on other schools but um, if that is the case then we can certainly look into it but I honestly believe with uh, that our, our schools are doing a great job of teaching the right technique um, as well as limiting as much contact as they can I mean it's not 20 years ago that's all we did was hit and tackle and hit and tackle, that's all you did. Mm -hmm. And it's changed so much and obviously we have to change. Todd, we've had our first question submitted and I want to send this to you. Um, from Stephen is his name. He says that he's in his early 50s. He suffered several concussions as a child from ages 3 to 12, including being knocked unconscious three times by blows to the head. Mm -hmm. After one of these is, is incidents, his family doctor said it was actually better to have a concussion as a kid because the brain was growing and generating new tissue actively and could overcome the injury more quickly and to a greater extent than an adult brain would. He said that if the brain literally would, would grow out of it as it got larger and more developed. He compared it to a scar you get as a kid healing more thoroughly than it would be if you got the, the same scar at age 40 because your skin was more youthful and quicker to heal. I take it um, that that thinking might have changed. Yeah, it might have changed, but those are all theory. It's a theory. It's still a theory, and some people are still saying that that you know it, that the brain recovers in youth better than it does dur during uh, uh, when you're older. Of course, I don't. Rec I mean, just think about it. We don't recover the same way. I mean, otherwise, I'd have some restorative hair going here. I mean, it's 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 very very it's very very similar. Once you have damage, there's damage, and w whether you recover a little bit or a lot. Uh, you're still going to have damage. Yep. Again, we encourage callers to, to um, submit their questions to us, and, and we want to talk about what's on your mind. At, uh, email to us at concussions at wyomingpbs.org. You can call us at 1-800-495-9788, or you can tweet us at wyoconcussions. Um, use that hashtag, wyoconcussions. Ryan, what are your thoughts about that? About, again, it has to do with this age issue. You've got athletes probably ranging in, in from what, 18 years old to 24, 25 years old. Um, even in that, that perspective, um, um, are there differences? Um, and the, the obvious answer is it's never good to get a concussion. Right, right. And, and I think 
do we see concussions and head injuries heal faster as adults? I, I think so. Um, a, a freshman coming in versus a, a senior, someone who's 22, 23, it, the trend seems to, but there, there's no right answer for that. And I think where a lot of this uh, legislation came from was the Zachary Leistet law in the state of Washington. And Zachary Leistet was a young student athlete who uh, took a hit in a high school football game. And uh, not a very significant hit at the time, um, but went back in, was uh, continued to play, and had the second hit, which was the second impact syndrome, where he um, suffered uh, permanent damage. But that's where we're seeing some of th this paradigm shift in, in the thinking and in, in the youth uh, uh, head injuries. Ha it really got the, the, the ball ro rolling with the Zachary Leistet issue in the state of Washington and that's really helped transcend concussion awareness and concussion education. But I think, the, from my standpoint, the youth, the adolescent brain is still developing and it, it's a very volatile brain. Mm -hmm. uh, we're all volatile with our, with our, uh, our brains and it, it's, a, it's an important organ that we have to take care of. It's, it's, it's not like anything else. So that's, that's where I'd say I would be um, a little bit more conservative on the fact that a younger child or adolescent um, it's, it's a significant uh, thing that you need to be aware of. Also on the, the concussion too, we always used to have that uh, thinking uh, that a concussion had to, you had to be knocked out for a concussion. Mm -hmm. I, I should have uh, also had that in the definition because that's not the case. Mm -hmm. It's a disturbance in, in the brain function. So concussion doesn't necessarily have to mean you were knocked out per se. Um, so I, that's important. To and I want to revisit that right now. Um, one of the, certainly in, in the research, we've learned that um, um, you can have traumatic brain injury and absolutely never have symptoms Symptom. of a concussion. So my question is, is what dialogue should parents be having? And if you could give advice to parents tonight, um, what would it be when, when their son or daughter comes home after the game, after the practice, or after the season to be a hawk and try to understand whether or not maybe some of these uh, injuries have occurred. Todd, I'll start with you with that question. Well, I w I, you know, the number one thing I guess I would say is that uh, uh, to take care of it and, and, and monitor it. If they come after, if, to say it again, Craig, because you got, got me going a little bit. I'm just saying, what advice would you, we, we know that um, uh, athletes may not really exhibit symptoms uh -huh. um, yet still have experienced traumatic brain injuries. Are there clues? Are there? Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, those are very, very subtle clues. I mean, I work in the post-acute. Work, I've worked with literally 500 to uh, over 1,000 people with traumatic, severe traumatic brain injuries that have been in coma. That is what, that is what I do. And when, and, and when, when, you, when you see those uh, subtle changes in a kid, cognitively, how they think, how they act, that, you know, it could be a ton of different things, but it also could be a, a, it could be a head injury or it could be a brain injury. I'm talking about depression. I'm talking about being agitated. I'm talking about where are my keys, you know, hey, what'd you do with this and this? You know, kid will get a little snotty with you. I've had four of them, so I know. And, and, uh, and then also, it, it's just, that's chronic and it's pervasive. Then it might be something. It might be something physiological uh, connected to a brain injury. It might be, but mm -hmm. those are just early warning things. One other thing I want to get back to, and then we have another question from a viewer, um, relative to the gentleman who was older mm -hmm. and had concussions when he he was younger. Mm -hmm. um, this is a little bit off topic, but I think it warrants discussion. Um, what do you tell now that middle-aged guy who? might not might be wondering tonight or might have wondered with all of the information about concussions that's been in the news I might have an issue I don't know what what resources are there for our for I our tell myself that all the time yeah. <laughs> we all have issues. and so yeah. so what do we tell what, what should they do um, should they visit obviously with their physician about this and um, what resources are available to, to folks well that how do they wondering? identify just the, 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 you're talking about chronic traumatic encephalopathy I mean CTE you know and and well, how do they find out? They have to cut your brain. They dissect you to, 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 to figure it out. If you start acting, the, 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 you can Google dementia. Look up dementia and, 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 and look at that and see, hey, am I starting to slip a little bit more? Hey, well, I'm, we're, we're all slipping as we get older. Are you slipping more than slipping? You know, is it, is it, is it extraordinary? So what should that person do? 
they contact a, 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 a neurologist mm -hmm. and, uh, and, or, or, and then if, uh, a neuropsychologist, uh, you know, and get evaluated. And, uh, you know, I mean, it could be Alzheimer's, it could be pugilistic sure. dementia, it sure. could be chronic traumatic encephalopathy, it could be, you know. All right, let's turn this back to youth sports. And, and this is a question that I'm glad that we've got tonight because we need to discuss it. Um, the question is this, for Millie is her name, if a children's physical condition is an important issue and there are dangers in contact sports, why not promote non-contact sports? What's so important about contact sports, she asks. What's so vital about contact sports that non-contact sports cannot replace? Why risk the health of children? I think that's an important question. Um, Ryan, let, let, me, let me start with you first um, about that because I think that there are many parents who are wondering whether um, football, for example, or wrestling, might be the right sports for their kids soccer, because Craig, or, soccer. or soccer, girls <laughs> soccer, um, perhaps yeah. might be the right sport for their child because they're concerned about this. Well, I think the concern is out there and we all have to be aware, do I have a right answer for that or a correct answer for that? I, I don't think I can answer that. It's a very valid point. You know, and I, I think we we're looking at something where the, the Mannings, Tom Brady, they were in football league, flag football leagues up until the age of 14. Right. Um, do you have to be in a contact sport league? No, not necessarily. Are there those leagues and wrestling uh, organizations and youth soccer? Absolutely. Um, going back to the foundation of sport, that might be wh where we're looking at you know, team building and dynamics, that kind of thing. I think in football, it, no matter what level you're at, it's, it's about proper technique and, and developing that along. Do we have an answer for that and do I have an answer for that? No, I don't. But I can give you the honest information that I have right now and just present it to you as uh, be aware of. But I don't have a specific answer of um, is this something that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Trevor, what are your thoughts about that question? I mean, obviously, um, um, at a national level, Participation in football is starting to shrink a little bit. It Not has. a lot, no. but some. Um, it's got to be an issue that you've thought about. Yeah, it, I mean, participation nationwide in the sport of football has gone down since like 2008. Not, not a lot. It's still over a million kids that play football uh, nationwide. So to, that, that's, as Ryan said, that's almost an impossible answer to give this person, um, this mom. Um, I have a kid that plays football, uh, he's a junior, and I think that I obviously am worried every time he comes on, on the football field, but at the same time, um, I know his coaches are teaching the right stuff, and, and like we talked about earlier, there's a risk in everything we do. Um, obviously, maybe a little higher in the sport of football, but it's a great game. Um, some great things that can be learned from that, as a, same as wrestling. Um, but, you know, you have to make choices, and if, if you want to run cross country, that's perfect as well. Um, so each family will treat that differently, but obviously the sport of football um, is a contact sport and you need to have that conversation with your son or daughter. Todd, you've, you've um, thought about the, um, the um, yeah. good things that can happen from participating in, in football your whole life. Mm -hmm. um, again, it goes back to that early question. What, how do we balance risks and reward of mm -hmm. participating in the sport? Mm -hmm. um, because it's essentially it's a value decision that the parent needs to make. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I can just go. I can just say that uh, I can look at my hands and say that these were all broken. These fingers were all broken on Pat Zillman's pads in practice. This clavicle was uh, up here by Charlie Wysocki in practice. This knee. That big. That big, I mean, I've got tons of injuries. My neck you know from from constant my elbow was had, I had surgery so I mean yeah I can't sit here and say as I've gotten older you asked me that 10 years ago 15 years ago and I'd say geez football's the best thing that's ever happened to me I mean I love football I wouldn't trade it I would not trade it now for anything I was not a great outstanding college football player I got to play and all that kind of stuff whoa 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 but I was I'm, I was I had a free agent trial to blah 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 nothing big for me, personally, I loved it, and I, went, I can't trade it. For my kids, I let my kids play. But logically, logically speaking, for myself as a dad and a parent, 
I, I, I would say you have to think long and hard about it. And then I, the other thing I'd say is you better train and get in shape. And I don't care what grade you're in, you get your neck strong, you get your shoulder strong, you get your leg strong, you get strong so that you can withstand the blows that football or any contact sport, it, it comes out. Now, you ask a lot of my guys, not the, if, I don't think any of the kids are up now watching, they, they, they look like oranges with toothpicks. You know, they got, they don't, their neck is like a little toothpick, you know, and they need to get strong. And, uh, you know, and you go to middle school, and I know it, I could be talking high school, but in middle school, do we promote strength training, weight training, and weight stuff? Why? Because the kids' muscles are developed. You would know, you guys know that much better than me. I know it's not smart, but I know they got to be strong in order to take well, those blows. Let's change the course of the, more. the discussion just a little bit. Um, I talk too much, I know. So. No, no, absolutely. It's, it's <laughs> a wonderful, way, wonderful discussion. About You're good. <laughs> but here's another question now um, from David. Um, and again, we encourage viewers to give us a call at 1-800-495-9788. We want to answer your questions tonight. This is what we're calling a parent's guide for uh, understanding about youth sports and concussions right here in Wyoming. Um, you can also email us at, at concussions at wyomingpbs.org, and you can tweet us also using the hashtag wyoconcussions. There are schools that are the haves and schools that are the have-nots based primarily on size, on whether or not they can have an athletic trainer on their staff. So here's the question from David. Should there be standards regarding the type of healthcare professional who can clear an athlete to return to play? Um, Trevor, let's start with you there, relative to the background on, on, on schools that have trainers, what other schools might do to try to, to fill that gap and what schools are doing today. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think, and I, I'm educating guests here, 15 of our schools probably have a certified athletic trainer. Out of? 70. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a touch higher, but I, I, I'd say 15 is pretty safe. A certified athletic trainer so that leaves 55 of our schools without um, so those schools you know might rely on a school nurse if they're lucky um, you know if we got schools like as rural as Cokeville you know that's that's out in the middle of nowhere well there for sure is not going to be an athletic trainer over there so they rely on the school nurses maybe an occasional doc that has the training but but the question is who can diagnose a concussion I mean these guys can answer that too that's that's a wide range of people. It could be a chiropractor with a vast knowledge and training in that area, but an athletic, certified athletic trainer certainly would have that training. Um, so it, there's a variety of people that can do it, and it just depends on where you're at and the people available to help you out. But that's a good question. Ryan, what should standards be for high schools? Um, this is coming from myself who just moved from the state of Arizona and we had uh, very strict restrictions on who could clear and uh, return to play student athletes. Uh, number one, I think it should be a physician, uh, medical doctor or DO. Uh, number two, certified athletic what, trainers. What's a DO? I'm sorry. A doctor of osteopathic medicine. Okay. Also a medical physician. All right. Um, you know, certified licensed athletic trainers um, and then you can also have specialties in uh, chiropractic care as well that also have uh, certain standard guidelines as well but I think um, we do have the rural communities in the state um, I'm originally from Alaska uh, we have r rural communities there as well well what we're seeing nationwide trending and, and worldwide is and what we may have to go to but let me point out that you need a physician care. I think that's first and foremost. That's who needs to clear the child for a return to play. But on top of that, there are going to be tools that are being developed uh, through telemedicine, through um, uh, computer-based medicine, that you may have the ability to see um, a neurologist through your iPad. Mm -hmm. uh, those kinds of things. So those are in development are they out there yet? No. The Cleveland Clinic is developing some great apps on the iPad. Uh, there's different things that will be coming along and down, down the road, but they're still in development. And those are the things that we need to look into for some of our communities that do not have licensed athletic trainers or physicians in the area. Mm -hmm. So, uh, or, or anyone qualified to look at a, the, the health of an athlete. You no, know, I should point out that, that Ryan, you participated in this research as it's being um, launched now at the University of Northern Arizona. 
um, which is exactly that, um, allowing a neurologist to be on the sideline, but really not. Correct. So Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, Arizona is a Division I institute um, that uh, I just recently came from. What we've been developing there is working with the Mayo Clinic and Dr. Bert Vargas in telemedicine. Their original telemedicine foundations were in stroke and studies there and they've proven and what the study is is it it's using um, computer-based technology to have a neurologist on a sideline is it valid that's what the research is doing right now that's what we're asking is this something that is valid is this something that will be able to be used in the future okay. that's that's the the point of the study right now at this point in time but there's also um, other technologies that are being used um, just to develop and, and work with um, different apps on the iPads or those kinds of things. But this can be a, a game changer for lots of different institutions, uh, whether it be the NFL, the NCAA, high school federations, or middle schools. Um, this may be where we need to go in medicine. But, but back to the original question, today in Wyoming, we all agree that it should be a physician. Or, or someone, um, um, a medical doctor. Sure. And then you're who, talking about expense. Should clear. You know, you're, talking about, you're talking about expense. I mean, an insurance for mom and dad. And that goes back to why let them have contact? Why let them have contact early? That's a very, very valid economic question as, where, as well as a, a, a health thing for, for anybody. I want to bend this conversation now towards soccer. Um, that we had oh, talked good. about that earlier. We a, have a question. That's a, that's a nice from twist. from Len, um, and uh, it's something I've wondered about. Um, um, all of my kids played soccer at, at, at the high school level and competed physically hard. And you wonder about headers and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So the question is this: Please address youth exposure to concussion trauma or subconcussion chronic brain injury arising out of heading of soccer balls. And what about the kids who use protective light padded headgear? <laughs> Her kids recently played against a Casper U14 uh, boys team where all the Casper players were wearing that headgear. What do we know about that? And what are the recommendations about that? I go first. Um, my foundation's knowledge in that is headgear, headgear can do so much. But again, the torsional rotation injuries of the brain inside the skull are what we cannot protect from. But do external helmets, headgear, help protect in some form or fashion. I would say it's better than uh, not having it on there for especially football. In soccer, I don't have the answer for that. I think it, it depends on the torsional hit of the, of the header. Um, but at the same time, I think some protection uh, could be valid and could be used. And if, if a team's using it and sees a diminished result in their head injuries over time, I think it would be something to look into some evidence uh, base medicine and see if that's something they can do. Yeah, the only thing with soccer is with with that with the um, with the head protection. When my son was playing soccer, I made him wear it. But um, there's there's no data. There's nothing out there that says this helps mm -hmm. because there's another theory that says well you put this on a kid's head now he's using it as a weapon, you know because he thinks he has this padding on that he's invincible now or she. So uh, even though I, I personally I'm not a doctor by no means I think it helps and I I, I recommend it for my kid but there's nothing out there that says it, it is beneficial. So, um, and that's why in, in soccer we haven't, we, the Federation has not adopted anything to uh, uh, require head protection mm -hmm. because there's nothing, no data out there that supports right. that that actually helps. Do the cowgirls wear the gear? Uh, I so. believe that some do. Yeah. They, it is not required in uh, it maybe a minimal level. level. Yeah. Correct. Here's another great question. Um, and um, we'll start, Trevor, with you about this because I think it's so important and it even goes to the um, point, I think, as to how concussions might be managed in smaller schools. What's the responsibility of the officials? This is asked by Tom. Yeah. Being trained to call student athletes um, that are out there using their helmets and tackling, how are they trained? Are they trained? The coaches want to win the game. The officials need to be allowed and trained to call these penalties and stop them. Right. How are they trained today? But Here's what we inform our uh, officials, uh, and, and all the federation, all the rules are the same for, regarding concussions. So if an official recognizes a sign or a symptom of a concussion, the, the athlete's dizzy, uh, wander into the different huddle, um, those are obviously serious ones, but if they see a helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact and they think they might suspect a head injury, their job, the official's job, is to remove that athlete from play, period. From then on, it's the school's responsibility as to whether or not that athlete returns. 
So the official's job is to clear the athlete, remove him from play, let coach know, hey, number 21 might have a head injury, make sure he's looked at, and then they proceed with the game. And it's the school's responsibility to clear the athlete with the physician or the athlete, certified athletic trainer, depending on who they have. Um, but as far as training goes, from right now, all we do is recommend the concussion tr uh, course for our officials. Uh, there are some, uh, some guidelines in the Federation rule books uh, for that, but um, if it's not an unconscious, we, we treat that differently. If it's an unconscious athlete, that athlete is removed and cannot return regardless um, until the next day, next week, or whatever, but they cannot come back that game. And we've had that rule since like 2005 mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Long for a long time, and we had that before anybody else even. Todd, what's your experience with officials? I know that, um, in fact, I think I read <laughs> that, that the Wyoming High School Activities Association this year kind of put out an, uh, an all-points bulletin that we're short of officials. By gosh, we have to have officials, <laughs> and um, we need them. So here, come on. And the first game they're going to do is yours, the middle oh, school yeah. game. Well, I'm going to go back so training? I can kind of hide. I'm going to go back 14 years when I first started coaching middle school, and then I coached at high school for a while, and then I went, I've been back at middle school five years. I'm going back to the guy in some other part of the state that I'm not going to mention. And he came in in cutoffs. He had cutoffs. It was a Saturday morning game, and they were looking for him. And he had a hanky, and, uh, and he had the hanky for this flag. And, and he looked like a doggone bozo rodeo clown. Yeah. And, and, and it, I was just like, whoa. And, uh, and uh, it, was, it was not good. And then uh, uh, recent experiences, uh, uh, of, just, of helmet to helmet contact, overt helmet to helmet contact, repeated helmet to helmet contact, and discussing that with a, a an, I don't like to get me, I don't like to rile up officials, so I like to be conservative with how I talk with them. I don't prefer, you know, burr, burr, burr. I don't like that. I might do that with the, I might do that, you know, other places, but not there, because I don't want to get that official mad at me. I know I'm running on. I'll, I'll get to the point. The point is, the training is not. Is, is, is not, it's not as important as it should be. It should be very, very important. They should know those rules, and they should enforce them. A lot of times it's a Saturday guy that's just coming to help. It's somebody to help in the community, and that's, it, a, that's a problem. Is it important for a coach then to bear some of that responsibility in talking to officials before oh, games? Oh, of course, and then afterwards. Sure, it's my responsibility, and it's my responsibility to pass that back to the athletic director, and it's my responsibility to talk to the coaches after the game in a nice way and talk to them and say, hey, listen, you know, can you consider tackling another way? And I've done that. Ryan, real, real yeah. quickly, I want to talk about equipment improvements. Um, and if there's anything that you see on the horizon, um, um, we talked just a little bit about the, the, the soccer uh, headgear. Um, we all agree that we've done a great job in learning how to protect bones, to protect the skull. Mm -hmm. But this thing sloshing around inside of our head called our brain is a different story. Do you see anything on the horizon um, in any of the research that's happening, or is there research happening that, that might be productive that um, we should keep our eye on? Um, this is all unscientific, but uh, you know, I think the biggest thing is possibly with the uh, involvement of fish oils and uh, omega-3 fatty acids and their involvement in brain health. Now that's still um, developing. And, and there's still a lot of research than, uh, being done for a traumatic brain injury as well as mild traumatic brain injury. And could that be the forefront? Could that be where we go to in the next step? From the little research that I've done, the brain is made up of omega-3 fatty acids, and I'm not a research scientist. But uh, the simple theory in that um, helping give a foundation of omega-3 fatty acids um, for brain health um, that could be where we're going to in the future. Um, so that, that is potential. Okay. And I think at going back to equipment, I've, you know, I've got Mad Dog at the University of Wyoming who is the best equipment manager in the nation. And he, he fits the student athletes better than anybody. And so I think that's imperative. For me, it's easy for me to say, can I get help here? Mm -hmm. But I think going back to youth sport and youth organizations and high school, it's very important. It's imperative that our coaches and our staff and our athletic trainers are being taught properly how to fit equipment properly. Let's go there now. Um, one of the things that, that I've asked Todd to do for tonight's discussion, and we can refer to these on, on our first chart, number seven, for those in the control room, is what recommendations are there? 
for uh, middle school reforms. And I know that um, Todd has thought about this at the middle school level as much as anyone. So he's put together a list for us. And I, I would like to go through those, Todd. Uh -huh. um, um, we have those in front of you. Our, our viewers are reading them now for the first time. Go ahead and talk about those just a little bit, if you would. Well, when you look at, I mean, just think about how if, if you played football or if you played soccer or if you played any sport, your coach has, your coach has a prescribed set of techniques that he uses, that he learned from somebody else, or that he acquired through some other form of knowledge. Wrestling, same way we were talking about wrestling. You know, there's ways you do a double leg take. There's standard ways you do things, and then there's other there's other ways that you can do things, right? And tackling is no exception, and blocking is no exception. The style of offense that you have, if you if you're a zone offensive team, the style of blocking is much different than a wing T style of blocking. So. You know, with that being said, a standard, a, a standard for tackling and angle tackling and tackling in the proper way, we all coach, we've all been taught if we played the sport on a frontal tackle. I don't even like to say a head-on tackle, I like to say a frontal tackle. That's standard operating procedures. Then we'll do the angle tackle one way and this way. Well, very rarely do we do vice tackling where there's two guys coming and, and coming up or gang tackling, which often it, we encourage in a game. And, and how do you teach that? safely in practice so you're not you're reducing uh, blows to the head mm -hmm. so a national standard for that for blocking and tackling I think or at least some kind of national guidelines where there these are accepted these are accepted practices above the knees tackle above the knees block above the knees block below the neck block uh, tackle below the neck and no more cut blocking no more of that kind of stuff some standard practices to protect you know how much it costs to go to an emergency room in Riverton, Wyoming? It's pretty dang astronomical. High school, it, it, okay, I know I'm getting off on a tangent. I'll be quiet. It's, it's right. expensive, okay? You suggest that the, the coaches should have mandatory, mandatory in-service right. to recognize is, signs it's, and symptoms. It's, 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 it's from here, but I'm saying sign off on it. And that's just an example. That's, a, that's one that we, you know, everybody pretty does, pretty much does. And you want to limit, Todd, contact during practice. Right. And, and how do you do that when you don't have the most physical Well, the team, 90 minutes in Texas, mm -hmm. I'll tell you, I'd rather make it 20. That's so doggone hot down there. It's 190 down there. I'd say practice mm -hmm. should only be 20 minutes with air conditioning. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I mean, I, what I would say, Craig, what I would say, I know I'll shut up. I'm, I'm getting You're off. doing great. But what I, what I would say is um, with this equipment fitting, with the safety rules, with the blocking, tackling, that it's standard and you sign off on it, you review the 20 minute thing. And then it's done every year annually before you step on the field. Now that might be done in some high schools, in the better high schools. I know Coach Harshman, I saw it in the Casper paper. Hey, we're doing our concussion thing, you help with the bill and all that kind of, that's wonderful. But small schools, middle schools, where it's part time and all that kind of stuff. No. Todd, Todd, talk about um, um, your idea to increase the number of practice days to 20 double the high school recommendation and then to I consider know, I know. the number That's of like games right in the, I know. And, and then rest between games. Crazy. Go ahead and talk about those. And those are chart nine for our folks in the yeah. control room. What, 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 I, what, I, what, I, what I, I want them to know, especially, I don't care if it's high school or not, maybe by high school they've got it down, but my skill acquisition from when I was in middle school to when I was in high school and then when I really learned football was from a coach that really knew football in college was so, so different that those kids up front need for safety's sake is what I'm talking about, need to know technique inside and out. They need to rep tackling a thousand times in a safe way before we put them out in a scrimmage and we put them out on a game thing so that we know that they've been taught the best that they can possibly do. Okay. That's what I'm. That's why the 20 days. It doesn't have to be 20 days if we can have six a days. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is, is that like anything else, tackling is a learned activity. Tackling and is a learned more activity. More likely to Fly do it. casting is a learned activity. To do it safely yep. if you have practiced over and over, regardless of the uh, monotonous monotony. Of you got to make it fun, or you won't have any kids on your team. That's why you have ice cream station. I'm kidding. <clears throat> I want to I want to um, um, conclude tonight with um, the serious part of this, and and I had the, the opportunity to visit with um, Dr. David Wheeler from Wyoming Neurological Associates, and I shared his information with our panel um, before we came on the air tonight. And one of the things that he he said, and we have this on a slide, is that um, 
We're finding that children who engage in football on a regular basis, even if they're not suffering a visible concussion at any time, are experiencing frequent acceleration and deacceleration of the skull, which results in mild traumatic brain injury that, can, that accumulates over time. His concern is that we've figured out ways to protect the bones of the body, and the helmet does a really good job at keeping the skull from getting broken in a collision, but it doesn't do anything to slow down the sloshing of the brain around inside the skull, and that's how the, those injuries occur. Mm -hmm. Again, all of us, I think, have to, 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 to shout on the trumpet tonight how important education is and, and proper skills and, and proper uh, technique. Um, we have just a couple minutes left this, minute, this, this evening. I would like each of you to, um, to talk about again um, what your message, your, your final sign off message is, is to parents. When they have to weigh this tough choice of the value of participating in a team sport with their team and then taking into account the potential for injury. I'll start with, I think, again, it's imperative for the education. And it's just not my responsibility or their responsibility or your responsibility. It's all of our responsibilities to get this out and to be aware of what's going on with the, the adolescents and the youth that are participating in sport. Now, that being said, I think there's excellent resources. My uh, go-to resource is the CDC and their program mm -hmm. with uh, their concussion education. It's a great resource that's available for athletes um, at all levels, but also coaches and parents, clinicians. It's in English and Spanish. Okay. There's, there's great resources there to use. Trevor, real quick. Same thing, just education. Parents and students need to be educated and, and then make the decision that's best for them. I mean, uh, football's a great game, but I'd certainly understand if they didn't want to do it. So. I, I want to wrap this up by um, saying again that we have links to all of those resources at wyomingpbs.org slash concussions. Um, as we learned tonight, parents, grandparents, athletes can look at these resources, learn, take the courses. They're free, they're inexpensive. They're important for us to learn about. And again, it's not just for football. No, it's for sports, concussion recognition yeah. and prevention in all sports. Absolutely. So we really want to thank um, our panel for being with us tonight. Thank you all for coming to Riverton. It's been a wonderful evening, and we want to thank you, our viewers, for being with us tonight.